Uh, but if you need an extra copy, raise your hand. The ushers will be glad to give you one. <clears throat> the title of my message today is Rest for Your Soul. Rest for Your Soul. Now, I want to quickly refer back to the parable that we looked at last week in the diagram because it's going to be the launching pad for what we're going to talk about today. Your soul is very important. The soul is the core of your being. It's, it's where happiness comes from. It's also where pain comes from and where stress comes from and where fear lodges itself. And taking care of your soul is very important and we started on this journey last week. And uh, so uh, what I want to ask you today is how is your soul? How's your soul doing? Now, how your soul fares depends on how well you take care of it. At the beginning of the year, a lot of people, they start some type of physical regimen. They're going to change their diet. They're going to start exercising. And that's all about what? The body. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's actually a good idea. Because you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in the body. Now, for our intents and purposes, as we talk today, I'm going to combine spirit and soul and talk about that as the soul because in a lot of places of the Bible, that's how it refers to it. Like when it says heart, it means your spirit and your soul together. That intangible, invisible part of you, then you have the body. So we a lot of times spend a, a lot of effort on getting our body in shape, right? But how much time do we spend on our soul, getting our soul in shape? Doctors say 75% of illnesses are psychosomatically induced. What does that mean? That doesn't mean they're not real. They're very real. But they say it comes from the, the sickness is brought on by mostly stress. Where does stress happen? That happens in your soul. So a lot of times the best thing you can do for your body is to take better care of your soul. A lot of the things that we struggle with in our body come from uh, problems that are going on in our soul and, and then your body because all these three are intertwined and they can't be separated, whatever happens in your soul is going to affect your body. And if something bad is going on in your soul, it's going to have a negative effect on your body. And conversely, if something good is going on in your soul, it has a positive effect on your body. So actually, by taking care of your soul, a lot of times it can bring healing into your physical body. Now last week we looked at this parable that Jesus told, and he, and he said something about the parable. He said, if you understand this parable, you can understand all parables. In other words, this is a key parable, the concept. And it has a, a lot to do with us as humans, and it has a lot to do with free will, and this is very important. And he told the parable, he said, a sower sowed the seed. Some of the seed, most of you know the, the parable, right? And the seed, some seed fell on the road, some seed fell in the rocky ground, some seed fell along the weeds, and some seed fell in the good soil, right? Say, and then the disciples said to Jesus, we don't understand this parable, explain it to us. And he did. So he broke it down, and here's what he said. He said, the seed is the word of God. So he's got a bag of seed. It's the same seed. It wasn't four different types of seed. It was the same seed. The seed's the word of God. And you say, well, well that person, you know, they, they prayed or they, they read the Bible, and, you know, it helped them, but it didn't help me. It's the same seed. It depends on what kind of soil that we are. So the seed is the word of God, and he sowed the seed, and the, and the soils are types of hearts or types of people. And what I said last week is you can change the type of heart that you have because there was a period in my life when I was down here, I was the hard soil. The word didn't, it bounced off. And so what he said is when it hits the road, the bird comes and steals the seed so it has no effect. So this guy, he never gets saved. He never gets born again because there's no life. There's, the seed does not turn into a plant. No life. And then he said the second type was seed that fell on shallow ground and it sprung up quickly, it said. But as soon as the persecution came, it died. So it started, but it didn't finish. Jesus uses the term, he said, it fell away. And then there's this third type of soil that said... It grew, but it says it didn't produce a crop. It didn't produce any fruit. Why? Because it got choked out, and it says specifically what choked it out. The cares of this world, the desire for other things. So things like worry and lust and materialism. The plant didn't die. This guy quit. He went back. Why? Because he has free will. You never lose your free will. Even after you get saved, God doesn't force you to continue to walk with him. No one's forced into heaven. No one's forced into hell. Both of those are choices. 
You choose heaven and you choose hell. All it is, people say, well, how could, how could a loving God? A loving God loves us so much he gave us free will and he will honor our choices. Why do people go to hell? Because they don't want God because everybody is offered God. And people choose, I don't want to have an eternity with whatever all that God is. So all hell is is a place where all the attributes of God are removed. And by definition, then it becomes the antithesis of everything that you ever wanted. That, all, that is all that hell is, is a ratification of people's free will saying, I don't want God in my life. And God says, I love you and I will honor your decision and I will give you a place where my attributes don't exist. And that's hell. And so that's a choice. It's all a choice. And these, that's just, this is why he said, if you understand this, you understand everything about Christianity and the kingdom is it's all based on our choices. Jesus has presented offer to us and then we choose to accept it or reject it and how much so this guy rejects it this guy accepts it and then changes his mind this guy accepts it but he stays at a certain level he doesn't produce any fruit and so what I'm saying is we got to examine our hearts and say where am I in this picture here because everybody's in one of these four and then he said the fourth type of soil is a good soil, and the good soil produces some 30, some 60. So is it only those three? No, it's a continuum. It's, you, you can start it 10 fold, 20, 30, 40, 50, you know. And these people produce fruit. Which one do you think God wants us to be? Right? So is this good enough? Just, you know, I got saved, and when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, that, that's, that's, that's better than the alternative, right? But wouldn't it be better for us to actually be the good soil? Because what I found is the more that you give to God, the more that he gives to you. And oftentimes this is where we get stuck. And then we're Christians and we, we, we love God. And, but, but, but life is really, really hard. And I, I'm not saying life ever becomes just, you know, a bed of roses because the earth is under a curse. But it's a lot better when you're not fighting yourself. You're only having to fight the effects of the curse and the devil. And what happens is when we, when we get swallowed up by the cares of this life, that we don't become productive and we don't walk into the blessings that God has for us. So that's the platform that I want to go to and refer to two verses that we looked at last week, which is 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health. How many would like to prosper? I don't know what the rest of you want, but I mean, that's all. I just say free will. It's good. I'm, how many want to prosper? And how many would like to have good health? Amen. Now, it tells us how to get it. Watch. Even as your soul prospers. Yeah. So what it's saying is prosperity and health ride on the condition of your soul. And so instead of just putting all our energy into prosperity and health, it would be better to put all our energy into the condition of our soul and it says that automatically these things will follow us. Just like Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added unto you. In other words, instead of laboring so hard, how am I going to get out of debt? How am I going to get healthy? How am I going to do this? How about putting so much energy into how is my soul doing? Is my soul faring well? Is my soul in the right place with God? And then if I take care of that, the other things will fall into place. That's what I think this scripture is saying. Beloved, I desire, God wants you to prosper and God wants you to be in good health. And he says, even as your soul prospers. The more your soul prospers, the more your body prospers, the more your resources prosper, and your relationships prosper, and everything that concerns you prospers. So what is your soul? Your soul is your mind. It's your will. It's your emotions. It's your desires. It's your dreams. It's how you see God. It's your connection to God. It's where you hear God and is where peace and love and joy reside all in your soul. So taking care of your soul is very important. How is your soul today? How's your soul doing? If you go to the doctor, he's going to check on your body. He's going to tell you your blood pressure. He's going to tell you your heart beats per minute. He's going to check all your levels. And so he's going to tell you how's your body doing. But is there someone you can go to that can check your soul and, and give you, wouldn't it be nice to get a readout? Like last time I go for an annual checkup and they, they do a blood thing, whatever, and they give you all your levels and everything. 
Ah, is there a place? What about if they could do that for you? How's your soul doing? And the, but we have to check that. We have to go. We, got, we have to go to the Word. We have to have friends in our life that we talk to and say, Hey, uh, I'm struggling with some area in my life. Can you help me? Help me in my soul. The struggles in life are in our soul. How is your soul today? Is your soul tired? Because what I found out is when your soul is tired, it doesn't matter how much sleep you get and how good you eat or how much coffee you drink. You'll still be tired. Is your soul weary? Is your soul stressed? Your soul can be stressed. Is your soul hurt and wounded? I mean, if you've got a wound in your heart, it affects every other area of life. I'm talking about taking care of our soul, looking after our soul, so that we could say, it is well with my soul, because you know what? If it's well with my soul, it's well in every other area of my life. How's your soul? Is your soul sad? Is your soul angry? I had an angry soul for years, and I didn't know it. I didn't realize there was a hurt and a wound that made me angry. I used to get, and some of you don't know this about me, but I used to get in a fight almost every day of my life. And most of the time, you'd say, that's the happiest kid, he's a nice kid. But one little thing would happen, and boom, there was something going on in my soul. I had no comprehension at the time until the Lord revealed it to me and showed it to me, and that thing got healed and taken care of out of my life, and that spirit of anger disappeared. Never fight a guy with a demon. I've been in hundreds and hundreds of fights and I've never, never lost a fight. Because when you've got a, a demon, it's, one time the seven sons of Sceva, they tried to cast a demon out of the man and the one guy beat the cheese out of the seven guys and they ran out of the house bleeding and naked, the Bible says. Because demons are, they're something. And I had a demon of anger that came from something that happened in my life and God ministered to it and he took it, took it out of my life and that demon left, that, that spirit of anger. I can still get angry, but not like that. That was, uh, it was like I was out of control. I never knew when I was going to punch somebody. I didn't think about it. It just, boom, it just happened. That's in your soul. That's why we have freedom group. Yeah. I didn't know. Even after I became a Christian, I had that thing. And fortunately, a pastor saw it in the spirit, and he prayed with me, and he prayed it, and it left me just like that. And I felt like a different person. I was completely changed. That's why we have freedom group, because you don't always know the stuff that's going on in your soul, the baggage that you're carrying, that your life would be better off without it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And that's what freedom group is. Some of the stuff that you're struggling with and you're praying and saying, why can't I get a victory in this area? It's because there's a baggage there that you need to get rid of. And that's what Freedom Group is un unveils and says, here's the thing. And God, it's just, it's really very simple. The power of God comes and he removes it. If you let go of it, you have to relinquish it and God will take it out of you. Like the Gadarene demoniac. Remember the guy Jesus went to? It said they couldn't hold him with chains. He used to cut himself. People could not restrain him because he was demonized. And Jesus just spoke a word, and boom, he was in his right mind. He was set free. I know, you know we're not to that level, but that, even if it was, that's how simple it is to get rid of it. And the stuff that we deal with, we carry, sometimes it came in at a young age, an innocent age, something was done to us, or we, we took a hurt, and something comes in with it that is not good for our life. Go to freedom group. My goal today is that you leave here better than when you came. My goal is that this coming week will be the best week yet of your life. Because we're going to talk about how to take care of your soul. My goal is that your life will be better. I, I want all of us to learn to take better care of our souls because I believe the better care you take of your soul, the better everything concerning your life will be. The better family, the better marriage, the better parenting you'll do, the better job, you'll be a better boss, you'll be a better employee, you'll be a better everything if you can have a better soul. Now, how do we do this? Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart or your soul with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. Don't let your soul go to the breaking point. Stop, rest, get some help. Have someone that you can talk to? Do you have people in your life you can talk to, that you can be honest with? And you don't need a hundred people, and you don't need to tell the cashier at Publix all the, 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 you know, the deep things of your life. It's not, you know, some people just tell everybody, and some people tell nobody. There's a healthy balance. It's to have a couple of good people that love you and care about you. In August, 
or had something happen. I mean, we had a, a tough year getting into this building. It seemed like everything came against us. It was very stressful for me. We got in the Friday before we came in. We were coming in on that Sunday. And Friday, all these last-minute things happened. We were going to have the last service. But then on another front, in a partnership I had with some people on a business deal, I found out, we've been talking about this for a long time, I was informed that they made the decision that I asked them, please, do, let's not do this. And they said, we did it. And it was just completely devastating to me. And they knew it would be. So I'm hit with that in my emotions on Friday. And I said, you know what? I am not even going to think about it because I got to, well, you know, this is going to be a... But then like Monday it hit me. It's like, are you kidding? Are you kidding? It wasn't just the financial aspect. It was the personal aspect. The emotional aspect is like, you know, these are people that supposedly they're my friends and I'm close to. And it's like, are you kidding? You really, you, you really, really, you really did this? Yeah, we did this. And I'm not proud to say, but I, something rose up. I became very angry. And the more I fought it, the more I said, no, then, you know, this is not godly. I, I need to, you know, the more I, I, I just, the more I wrestled with it, the more angry I got. Now, as I said, I got rid of the spirit of anger. Otherwise, I would have, have gone over there and punched all of them. But I'm just wrestling with it. And I'm, what I'm saying is you need, you need to deal with your soul. You can't just let it go. And you can't let it accelerate. And I called my friend Scott Hornsby, who's an overseer of this church. And I just poured out to him. I told him exactly what happened. It's good to have people in your corner sometimes, right? And he said, well, you know, we could do this and we could do that. And I said, you you know what? I I was honest with him. I said, I am not happy with the thoughts that I'm having in my mind. I am not happy with the things that I'm thinking. I, I, and I said, I'm not going to do anything for a few days because I'm not even in a condition to talk to them or do anything or take any kind of action. I need to fix me first because no matter what I do, it's right now, I'm not in a good place. And he prayed for me. He said, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you realize that. I'm glad you're doing that. And he, he prayed for me. He prayed for my soul. And I, f- I felt a peace from, from that. And, th- and then, I, you know, honestly, I called my friend Lee Grady. And I poured my guts out to him and my friend Mark Quattrochu, who's, who's a, a, another mentor of mine and another ARC pastor. <laughs> and they all prayed for me and they all encouraged me and they all strengthened me. And then I, I was talking to Rebecca and, you know, about all this. And she said, you just need to, you need to get away. I had decided to take two weeks off the beginning of August, to take two weeks off. She said, you need to go get away. And I did. And I got, I got a... A room in St. Augustine. I went over there, and you know what? The beginning of it was. I took, I, I, I took, I found out you can get songs on your phone. Did anybody? Does anybody know that you can actually download? You can have songs. I found that you can actually get these albums on your phone, and then I found that you can buy this little speaker that you can put over there, and it sounds like really good, and it actually talks to your phone and plays music from your phone and the thing. It's amazing, you guys. I'm just. It's a good thing you came to church today. You didn't know that, did you, right? Okay, this stuff, it actually works, and it works pretty well. And then I, I had found this little girl, a Christian singer named Lauren Daigle, and I sat in that room, and I turned that thing on, and I brought the boat, and I thought, I'm just going to go fishing. And you know what? I didn't need to go fishing. I just needed to push play on that little button, and I'm going to tell you, I had some time with God. And the song, and the worship, and the ministry, and I thought, that, that girl wrote that song for me. God knew I was going to be here today and needed it. And those songs, and you know what they did? They washed my soul, and I just alone had some time with God. And that's where you fix your soul is between you and God. Is it well with your soul? You've got to get alone with God. Francis Assisi said, what a, uh, what a man is before God, that he is and nothing more. You've got to get before God. And, and as, let me tell you, I'm going to give you one of the keys to refreshing and healing your soul is worship. In our Christian journey, worship is an interesting experience. When you first get saved, you come to church and you watch worship. Did you ever notice that? You just kind of watch it. Wow, that's pretty cool. Look at all these people worshiping. That's pretty neat. I like those, I like those colors. It's pretty, pretty cool. It's a pretty good song. Oh, the screens actually have the words up there. And you watch worship. And that's a great experience, right? That's a new thing. And it's like that's really cool. And it's beneficial. And then you go to the next level where you actually start reading the words and thinking. And, you know, even think, you start in your mind, you actually start worshiping. And it's it's, it's the next level. 
And then there's the third level, which maybe some people never even get to, where you actually worship yourself and the words come out of your mouth and sometimes your hands go up and you engage and you engage in worship. And let me tell you, each level is the law of sowing and reaping. The more you engage, the more you get back and the more your soul is cleansed. And as I was there in St. Augustine playing that thing on my phone, the magical amazement of that, and that I'm telling you, my soul was washed. And the anger began to leave and the bitterness. And then, that, then I began to th be able to think clearly and say, okay, here's the way I'm going to deal with this situation. I had to get that which was not of God, uh, which was my thinking, my way of dealing with it. It had to get washed out and worship was a key right there. Getting, yes, counsel, I had to talk to some people. I had to read scriptures. I get up and read the Bible. And then as I worship, so I'm going to give you some keys, some components. I'm already giving you some hints on how that works, on how to deal with difficulties in your soul. You need to deal with it. It won't just go away. If I just sit there, the anger will boil bigger and hotter and worse, and I will eventually go do something something dumb, really dumb, bad dumb, that may be irreversible. And sometimes we do that because we don't deal correctly with the junk that's going on in our soul and put it in its place and, and get rid of it many times so that you can make a wise decision and hear from God. Because if you do it in your own strength, it will not go well. It will not go well with you. I want your soul to be refreshed. I want you to receive healing. Here's a quote that I heard that I think is excellent. It says this, if you're tired, don't give up. Rest. That helped me. <laughs> it helped me because sometimes things get so stressful. It's like, I just need to quit. No, you don't need to quit. You need to rest. And that's what I want to talk about today is finding rest for your soul. Matthew 11:28. Jesus speaking said this, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. And what? What? Watch this. I will give you rest. You know what? Jesus wants to give rest to your soul. He wants your soul to rest. He doesn't want to be struggling and striving. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am what? Gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest. Everybody say find rest. You have to find rest. Find rest. You find it in God. You find it in the Bible. You find it in worship. You find it in church. You find it in small group. You find it in fellowship with like-minded people. You have to find it. You find it in God. You find it in Jesus. Learn from me, he said, not just of me. It's good to learn of him, but you have to learn from him. And the key then is in that yoke is where you learn from him. How do you find rest for your soul? You start with come to me. <laughs> See, if I, if I didn't go to the word and go to prayer and go to my godly counsel and I would have just gone to me, I would have come up with a different solution to my problem. And by the way, God worked it all out, turned it all around. It ended up working out for my good, better than I could have imagined. God ended up turning it all around. Why? Because I gave it to God and decided not to take it into my own hands. And God turned that whole situation around. That at the time, it was just... And then God turned it around. Hope. Faith. you got to walk in love. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. Because you know what? God invented rest. God invented the Sabbath. What does it mean, come to me? Here's some things that come to me. Here's how you come to him. Number one is prayer. Prayer. Come to God. Prayer. Don't just throw all your stuff up there. Listen. Prayer is a two-way conversation. Second way is worship. Worship. See, uh, if, if worship is humility... Why would I worship when I got this problem? I need to work on this problem. I need to go see a lawyer. I need to go do this. I need to go beat somebody up. I need to take things into my own hands. And worship is, uh, you know what? Maybe I just need to step back and, uh, and just worship God. That's humility. Pride says just go take it into your, Go fix it yourself. Worship turns the thing around. So number one is prayer. Number two is worship. Number three is the Bible. Go to the Word of God. It'll give instructions. I read the Bible, it says, thou shalt not murder. Okay, I can't do plan A. That was plan A, was plot to kill all these people. Okay, that's, okay, I can't do that. I wanted to. I did. But I'm not going to do it. You have to be guided by bigger principles than what you can come up with in your mind. You do what the Bible says you can do, and what you can't do, you don't do. So go to the Bible. Four is church, church, people, I, Share it with, with the lead team. We had the lead team in. I said, listen, guys, I need you to pray for me. Church, go to church. You're being encouraged today. You're being built up. You have a time of worship. We look at the Bible. All this is 
compacted right in here in this marvelous institution that Jesus created called the church. And the fifth thing is fellowship. Fellowship, and that's what small groups are all about, is learning, getting to meet some people face to face. A church is great. You get to look at the back of somebody's head, check out their do, do their haircut, how's it going, or maybe the shine. And then you, but looking at the back of somebody's head, that's great. But it's better to look at somebody's face. Small groups, you look face to face. You look somebody in the eye. That's why it's small groups. Fellowship is important. These are the keys. The next key to finding rest to your soul is what Jesus said. He said this, take my yoke upon you. We're going to go back through this verse a little bit and find keys because Jesus is telling us right here, he wants to give rest to your soul. He doesn't want you struggling. He doesn't want you in pain. He doesn't want you hurt. He doesn't want you to be dejected, depressed, discouraged. He doesn't want you there. He wants to give rest to your soul and he gives the key. First thing is to take my yoke upon you. Now here I have a picture of a yoke. What does a yoke look like? This is very important to understand. Because sometimes you think of a yoke as just being a harness. And there's a difference between a harness and a yoke. And this is a yoke. Now notice something significant about the yoke. It involves two animals. That's what yoke means. If we say um, uh, 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 Elisha was plowing with a yoke of oxen, that meant two. And it actually said he plowed with 12 yoke, which means 24, because he got the double anointing. But a yoke is two. A harness just puts one in contact with the plow or whatever the implement is that they're pulling. A yoke does something else. It puts the two animals together in sync so that they pull together. And what they found out is if, if like one draft animal can pull 8,000 pounds and they put two of them together, guess what? Do you think they can pull 16? No, they can pull like 40,000 pounds because there's something, there's an increase. But what the yoke is, is that Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. We're yoked to the Lord. You're not in this by yourself. It's very important to realize when you're going through something challenging for your soul, don't do it alone. You're yoked to the Lord. And then church is an extension of the Lord. And godly people are extension of the Lord. And the small group and worship is an extension of the Lord. But Jesus himself is with you. You are not alone. So take my yoke means you don't have to do it all by yourself. And this is where you find rest. Because he's got the power. <laughs> he's got the power. Take my yoke and learn from me. And what do we learn? He's gentle and humble. See, the ideas that I had, they were not gentle and they were not humble. They were harsh and they were prideful. They were my solution to the problem. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to take care of it in my own strength. That's not God. No, that's not God. Because he's gentle and humble and it's going to be take a different position and leave, give it to God and watch what God can do. And, and then uh, finally I was able to do that, give it to God. And God, like I said, turned the whole thing around in a way that I never could have done with my own strength. Being gentle and humble will give rest to your soul. If you're struggling, if you're angry, if you know how to, that's not rest. No, your soul is not resting. And many of us deal with this. We deal with this on a constant basis. But many of us allow for it. And we just think that it's normal. And this is just the way it is. And what I'm saying to you today is to begin to hate that. To hate it because there's something better in store for you. It's rest for your soul where God can take off the load off the yoke and bring the solution that you were desiring anyway. And bring the favor and bring the blessing. So we have to be gentle. Pride stresses our soul. Anger stresses. Anger will kill you. It will make a blood vein burst in your brain or in your heart or someplace else. It will have a negative, deleterious effects on you. Anger works its way out in negative ways in your body. It's not good. You've got to deal with it. It's not good. Are you stressed all the time? Do you think about taking revenge? It's in the, okay, that's, I'm, I'm in my own strength. Don't fight in the natural. Fight the good fight. Paul said was the fight, what fight? The fight of faith. It's trusting God. It's believing God. And what does he say? He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. <laughs> when we actually get yoked with God and quit trying to do it in our own strength, it will get easy and it will get light. We're still on the planet. We're still on a fallen planet. There's still a curse. There's still crud. There's still stuff that's happening. We're not going to ever float through life on flowery beds of ease. But if we can eliminate, if we got crud that's here by nature that, that will always be here, why add to the crud with the bad decisions that we make and then it makes it overwhelming? 
if I got rid of the crud that I created myself with my bad thinking, and then I could overcome the crud that I have to face in this world, and I'll be an overcomer, and I'll be encouraged, and I'll seek out work. But when I'm overwhelmed because I'm making wrong thinking, and I'm overwhelming my own soul to where I can't hear the voice of God, then it becomes overwhelming. Why do people commit suicide? There's a lot of different reasons. Some, sometimes it's physiological and it's physical, but most of the time it's because their soul is so stressed and they don't see any way out when there is a solution to our souls. There's a way to get the freedom in our souls. Hmm. So stuff happens, and we end, but we end up carrying too many burdens, and you know what? We're really not created to be a beast of burden. We're created to walk in fellowship with the Lord and cast our cares on Him to turn them over to Him. That's the faith walk. You have to have faith. John 14, 1, Jesus speaking, He said this, Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let. What's the subject of the sentence? It's you understood. You could say it this way. You, hey you, you, right there. You, don't let your heart be troubled. You, yeah, you, yeah, you, don't let your heart be troubled. Yeah. I'm the one that has to not let my heart be troubled. So the good news is, if he said that, then it's possible. And I found out it's just a decision to say, I ain't going to worry about it. That goes against everything in me because I, I want to fix stuff. I want to make it happen. I mean, there's most of us, you know, I'll find a solution to this. And that's an act of faith where he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Okay, I'm just not going to worry about it. Well, how's it going to get fixed? God's going to have to do it. You're going to have to live up to your word. You have to stand on scripture and say, you told me if I trusted you, take care of this. That's what I'm going to trust in. I'm going to trust in you. How do you not let your heart be troubled? Psalm 42, 5 says, why, my soul, are you downcast? This guy is speaking to his soul and questioning why it's downcast. Have you ever had a downcast soul? Sure you have. Did you ever ask yourself, why are you doing that? Why? Hey, hey. And that's what he says. Why, my soul, hey, soul. Why are you downcast? Don't you have a God in heaven? Didn't Jesus go to the cross for you? Didn't he say, I'll never leave you, forsake you? And you have to talk yourself out of the fear and the anger and the stress that you're into by looking at the scripture and see what the, God, what the Bible says. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? And this is where we lose the battle is, is within us. We get disturbed within me in my soul. Take care of your soul. You got to find rest. Your soul needs rest. You need to rest. You need to quit stressing your soul out with all this worry. Yeah, but you, no, no, yeah, buts. Yes, just yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yeah, yeah. I just, I need to rest my soul. That's why in the beginning of creation, God said, labor six days. The seventh day you shall what? Rest. He knew we needed rest. One out of seven. You got to rest. You got to rest your soul. You got to rest your mind. You got to rest your body. Why? The scripture is in Psalm 42. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed? Well, watch. Here's a solution. Put your hope in God. Yeah. Talk to your soul. Say, hey, soul. Hey, it ain't all on you. You can't do it anyway. Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him. There's that worship again. Yeah. When you can praise him in the midst of the battle, you know you're on your way to victory. When you can throw your hands up and say, Thank you, Jesus, you're going to get me through this thing. You know the breakthrough's getting ready to come. Yet will I praise him, my Savior and my God. Why so downcast? Good question. What am I allowing in my soul? Here's some things that we allow in our soul that are not good for us. Fear, anger, bitterness. Don't feed that bitterness. Doubt negativity, hatred, pride, resentment. And I put some places in the notes and make, maybe, you know, just don't act like you're writing anything down you know, so nobody can see you, but do it. you might want to write some stuff down, you know, things that step, step out, jump out to you and say, you know, that's something I'm dealing with. Let's just be honest. Eh? Everybody's got something you need to write down. Everybody should be writing on this. Jealousy, materialism, the thought that if I just have this, I'll be happy. Worry, prejudice, hating people just for how they look like, rebellion, anxiety, striving. These are all not good for your soul. And what do I want to force into my soul? And yes, I said force into your soul because it will not just creep into your soul. No one drifts in a God-honoring direction. You have to go against the stream because the current of this life is negativity, is fear, is anxiety, is pride, is selfishness. So to, to get good stuff in your soul, it's it's a battle. It's a struggle. You have to force these next things into your soul. What do you have to force into your soul? Love, 
joy. You may not feel joy. You have to force joy into your life. Peace. You have to force peace into your life. Patience. Goodness. Kindness. Faith. Humility. Gentleness. Self-control. Hope. Charity. These are the things that you have to force into your life so that you can rest. Let your soul rest. And stop striving and struggling. And start praying and trusting. And you have to work hard to rest. <laughs> You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. You have to work hard to rest because he's already got the victory. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes, this is something you can fall back on. We know that God causes what? All things to work together for good to those who love God. Those who are called according to his purpose. First John 5 says, for whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. I think we had a crash on the computer, so you just have to follow along. And this is the victory that has come that this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You have to cast your cares on him to give rest. You actually have to work to rest. It's right here. Look in Hebrews chapter 4. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. How many people of God we got here? There remains a Sabbath rest for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did. Therefore let us be diligent and the King James says labor to enter his rest. Labor to enter. Be diligent. This is where you apply the effort. This is where you work. You work to rest. You work to cast your cares. You work to not fear. You work. That's the work. The work of the Christian is not to fix everything. It's to stop worrying and rest and trust in God. (laughs) That's the challenge. That's the work. That's the work in this situation. I, I could have said, I'm going to fix this, and you know, you know, I was thinking about it, but when I just gave it to God, and I just went in that room and just said, I'm just giving it to you, God. You know what? God fixed it in a way that I didn't even think of, and better than I ever thought of. I thought, we're going to have it. This is it. It's head on head. We're going we're to go at this, we're gonna, and, I'm, and maybe we can work this out. And you know what? God just did something way above and beyond I could ask or think because I was able to just get away and just give it all to him and worship. And you know what? Some of you, you got stuff, this baggage, this stuff that, that you're carrying, stuff that you're carrying it around, and it's time to let it go. <laughs> it's time to let it go. I know, and I'm not saying somebody didn't wrong you or do you wrong or hurt you. I'm just saying you... You cannot continue to carry that poison in you because it's not going to do you good. So I want to ask you, how is your soul today? How is your soul? We're going to get, everybody's going to get rid of something today. Everybody's going to leave something in this room and leave this building without something that you brought in here. There's, everybody's got something because the world's under a curse. People can be mean and harsh and hard. And some of us have been carrying stuff for our whole life. And maybe and God's going to begin to reveal it to you. But you know what? It's going to require something of you, and that's, that's to let it go. How is your soul? Is it stressed? Is it tired? Is it burned out? Jesus would say, come to me, come to me, and I'll give you rest. I'm going to tell you a little story that I believe is going to help you, because I know we're going to pray, and we're going to get rid of some stuff. Everybody's going to get rid of something. I used to be on staff at a church. The pastor had, had been a, a beautiful, wonderful man of God. He was a missionary in Africa for 17 years, and he, he was in the bush almost all the time. And he told me a story one time of how the bush people, how they would catch monkeys. He said what they did was they, they took a jar, and they, they would chain it to a tree, and they put a peanut in the jar, and they, it had a certain size opening to the jar. He said the monkeys would... They'd smell that peanut, they'd see what they did, and they'd come down out of the tree, and they'd stick their hand into the opening in the jar, and they'd grab that peanut. He said, then they'd just walk up and they'd grab the monkey. So well, how, how is that so simple? Because the monkey would never let go of the peanut. So he got captured because he wouldn't let go. If he let go, he could have got his hand out. But once he got his hand on that peanut, he wouldn't let go. And so then he was captured. Sometimes we get a hold of something. We get a hold of some anger. And we've we've had it so long, we won't let it go. And then God can't get us. And then the enemy takes us captive. He takes advantage of us. And so what I'm saying today is there's something. There's something that you need to let go. But you need to to let go. If the monkey would let go of the 
subpoena, he could have got away. But if you and I won't let go of that thing, then you're going to be taken captive. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you, and, and there's going to be a spiritual breakthrough. I've, I've preached the message, but the power is not in the message. The power is in you letting go. The power is in you letting go. And I'm believing that everybody's going to leave today without something that you brought in. Lord, here we are. Here we are. We've been through life. Life is tough. You've been hurt. I've been hurt. Everybody's been hurt. Maybe you got a lot of stuff that you're holding on to. Maybe it's just one thing. Maybe you're not even sure, but you just know that your soul, there's not rest in your soul. And I would ask the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, just show us. That's what that pastor did for me. He said, you got a problem. I said, I ain't got a problem. You got a problem. And he said, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. And you know what? The Holy Spirit showed me something I didn't even remember. And that set me free when I let it go. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit right now to show you something that's in your hand, it's in your heart, it's in your soul, and you just need to let it go. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to be free. I want you to leave here free. I want healing to come into your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Now just you see what it is and just, just let it go. You know, well, no, no, I, 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 can't, I can't let this go. Yeah, you can let it go because you know what? God will take care of it. God will take care of that person. God will take care of whatever happened. God will bring his revenge, his vindication, his justice, his righteousness. But you have to let it go to get healed, for your soul to have rest. To leave here and this week have rest in your soul that you so desperately need, you're going to have to let that thing go. So right now, Father, we give this. We let it go. I let it go. We just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. We let it go, Lord God. We give it up. We give it up. We give it to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Father, now I, I just say I receive healing into my soul right now in Jesus' name. I receive rest into my soul. I let that go. I give it to you, God. You take care of it. Now I receive healing right now. Lord, I thank you for sending healing power into every person right now. Rejuvenation, a joy for life, zest for life, excitement of life, health in bodies that have been broken and have been hurting. As we let this go, Lord, bring healing into these bodies, into these minds. Refreshment, a zest for life. You said in your word, you renew our youth like the eagle. I thank you for a new start for a lot of people that are here today. A fresh start, a new start, a new life, a new zeal for life, a new excitement, a joy coming back into your life. Yeah. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Restore unto us. I let go. Just as we let it go, Lord God, we receive something supernatural from heaven. And we say from this day forth, we are yoked to you. We're going to let you do all the pulling. We're just along for the ride. You're not my co-pilot. You're the pilot. I'm just, I'm in the back seat. I'm letting you drive. You take the wheel. You go ahead, Lord God. I am your servant. You are my God. You're going to take care of me. Thank you, Lord. Now just begin to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for victory. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for healing. Thank you for a new outlook on life. Thank you for bringing into me everything that I need to be a success in this life and to do what you put me on this earth to do. And that is my great desire is to fulfill your desire that you would say on that day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master. And right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, I got a very important question for you and that is this. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? You might be here and you say, I don't know. I think so. I hope so. I'm not sure. Does anybody really know for sure? Does anybody know? Yeah. The Bible says I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you get eternal life? Someone asked Jesus that question. Here's what he said. He said, you must be born again. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Having a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Having Christian parents doesn't make you a Christian. It means you surrender your life to Christ by an act of your free will. You ask him to forgive your sins. He comes, he lives on the inside of you. He makes you into a new person. If you've never done that or you're not sure if you've ever done that, that's why you're here today. In just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And we're going to take care of that. But you might be here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I did that in the past, but today I'm not where I want to be with God. And I want to get back on track with God. Every head bowed and every eye closed, and I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. I just want to pray with you and for you. But if either one of those two apply to you, if you're not sure if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven, but you want to trust Jesus with your life, or you need to get back on track with God, would you just slip up your hand real quick right, right now where you're at? Raise it up high so I can see it. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. It's a fresh start. Fred, you want a fresh start. 
You want to start all over. Anybody else? All right, put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died on a cross for my sins. God raised you from the dead. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Dear Jesus, please forgive all my sins. Come live on the inside of me. Make me into a new person. Wherever you lead me, I'll follow. From this day, forevermore. Right now, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Give the Lord praise. People prayed that prayer. Meant business with God. If you prayed that prayer for the first time on the connection card, there's a little box, and if you check that box, I'm going to send you some special materials in the mail. Hold on to your connection card. We're going to put it in the offering basket in just a couple moments. There's going to be some prayer teams up here at the end of the service to pray with anybody that needs prayer. If you don't have a Bible, come on up. We're going to give you a Bible. Put your name in it. Uh, You can put your connection card in the offering basket. And I'm going to give you the offering scripture, which is this. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. So he didn't say he'd he'd multiply your bread. So that's, that's the end result. He said he'd multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So basically what it's saying is if you want to increase, we have to increase our sowing. We have to increase our giving. You you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. The more you give, giving is not giving away. It's giving into your future. It's seed in the ground that's going to produce a harvest. Always see giving with an expectation of God's going to return it unto me in a greater way. There's three ways to give. You can give in the envelope. You can give on the website, or you can text to give. Let's pray over the offering. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give good seed into good soul. I ask you to give back to the giver a hundredfold return. I pray this blessing over your people that you had Moses speak over your people years ago. I say they were blessed coming in. They're blessed going out. In the city, in the country, in their home, in the field, when they get up, lie, get up when they lie down, Blessed is their bread and their water, their basket, their bowl, their barn, their bank account, their job, their home, their animals, everything they have. I command the blessing of God upon them. I say the enemy might come against them one way. He'll flee seven ways before their face. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against them in judgment, they will condemn with the word of God. They're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. They will lend and not borrow. In all that they put their hand to, they'll increase. I call increase into God's people spiritual emotional, physical, financial, social increase, blessings from every direction, opportunity to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, and to lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. God bless you as you give.